Hey folks! I recently played through Skyward Sword and I was reminded of the importance of target audience in game design. I'll be spending some time today talking about the target audience problems I see in this game and how in my view they adversely affect the gameplay experience. Let me first provide some background. The most important question a game designer asks themselves is what am I trying to accomplish? Games are creative works that people create in order to achieve something, like giving players a sense of accomplishment or creating a fun social experience for friends. With the exception of some purely artistic works, that means the goal of a game is closely tied to another question, who is this game targeted toward? How players experience a game is critically dependent on things like what kind of experience they're looking for, their sophistication with computer games, the way they like to play games, and so on. Conveying a specific experience means targeting the group of people who are most likely to enjoy and appreciate it. Personally, I think Skyward Sword is a great example of what happens when a designer fails to do this. A brilliant title gets transformed into a mediocre one. I'll start by talking about the game's approach to player competence. This is an important question because assumptions about a player's basic intelligence permeate throughout an entire title. Dark Souls assumes that its player base approaches the game thoughtfully and carefully. This allows it to cut some corners, like never fully explaining how leveling works in order to avoid a ham-fisted tutorial that could take someone out of the experience. It trusts that players are smart enough to press the help button if they're not sure what the different statistics mean. There's clear potential here for problems. Misallocating statistics can handicap a run and make it exceptionally difficult to clear the game. The Souls series avoids this by targeting more experienced and older gamers for its audience. It can safely assume that someone who's been playing games for a while isn't going to randomly allocate points and proceed to blame the game for their own mistake. In fact, the respect that Souls shows its player base is one of the major reasons for the series' appeal, drawing in players who feel that modern games condescend with endless tutorials and trivially easy gameplay. By contrast, Skyward Sword's approach is all over the place, which means the experience is frustrating regardless of your experience with games. The crafting system is a great example. Bringing up item descriptions after every quit and reload only makes sense for an audience of small children, since kids will forget these kinds of things very quickly. The repetition of instructions by fee and the regular reminders to realign the controls also fall under this category. The problem is that this clashes with numerous other features that specifically target players who aren't small children. The combat can be quite punishing due to unreliable motion controls, and the puzzles require keeping track of several things at once. The introduction to the game calls for Link to determine the location of his loft wing. This requires the trip back to the academy, speaking with a senior, speaking with the sparring instructor, finding the waterfall, working through a small dungeon, and hitting the rope ties keeping the bird caged. This is straightforward for an adult, but far too complex for the type of person who needs two reminders that low health is a bad thing. Skyward Sword's most basic accessibility features imagine a target audience that is otherwise completely incapable of clearing the game, or even making it past to the introduction. The key point here is that a feature for one player will feel like an annoyance for another. One of the reasons for focusing on a target audience is specifically to avoid these kinds of no-win situations. Veterans will be constantly annoyed by the pedantic reminders of what items are and where they're supposed to go, while newer and younger players will simply get stuck and fail to make any meaningful progress. If these features were intended to broaden the game's audience, who exactly did they broaden them to? Personally, I think the answer is nobody. Next, I want to talk about what players are looking to get out of a game. Like I mentioned earlier, games are creative works that are trying to accomplish something, and this is usually related to some kind of player experience. For instance, many players play competitive StarCraft to feel the reward and satisfaction of improvement after long hours of practice and learning. Competitive StarCraft complements this desire with features like a formal ranking system, automated tournaments, fully featured replay tools, and so on. One of the key reasons players play Zelda games is to experience a sense of wonder and discovery. One of the series' core design features is the way exploration and puzzle solving happen organically. Players solve puzzles because the puzzles are compelling. They explore because the series crafts rich and vibrant worlds that players naturally want to explore. One of the biggest surprises for me every time I replay an older Zelda game is a number of things that are completely optional. I do them because I want to, not because they're required. Skyward Sword opted to reuse its major environments three different times, meaning that the organic discovery that comes from exploration is mostly lost by the second half of the game. The designers worked around that by introducing the dowsing mechanic, allowing players to skip directly to their objective. 
As an aside, I'll point out that this doesn't actually fix the core problem. Players didn't need dowsing in previous games because they liked exploring without the game forcing them to. The dowsing system is just a band-aid for a larger design flaw. But the main issue I have with dowsing is its intended audience. Players looking for a linear adventure game don't want to trek across the same environment numerous times just to get to their objective. Fee's constant hints and ability to tell the player exactly what to do fall into this category as well. Players who want a more linear experience will find this cumbersome. This is why so many linear games use the overworld design approach. It's easy to develop, enables fast progression, eliminates filler content, gives a sense of a large and interesting game world, and so on. There's a reason this design is still going strong after more than 20 years. On the flip side, the core Zelda audience that enjoys exploration for the sake of exploration is only hurt by this feature. Dowsing often acts as a safety net for sloppy or tedious level design that prevents organic discovery. The Tad Tones are an excellent example of this. What this means is that even players who don't mind backtracking will still need to rely on dowsing some of the time. Best case scenario, dowsing is just clutter on the user interface for players who'd prefer to discover things on their own. Once again, we see that the middle of the road approach really doesn't end up working out for anybody. Finally, I want to talk about the motion controls. Now I have no inherent bias against motion controls in principle. As an early adopter of the Wii, I played countless hours of Wii Tennis and have nothing but good memories of that game. That being said, motion control technology still hasn't reached the point where it's as reliable as standard button inputs, meaning its value lies in games where precision and reliability aren't very important. That's not necessarily a criticism. Like I said, Wii Tennis is a perfect example of a game that works better with motion controls than a standard controller. Skyward Sword uses motion controls everywhere, often with veterans of the series in mind. The shield durability system is a particularly clever application, introducing a risk-reward mechanic in which the player needs to carefully decide between attempting to correctly execute a shield bash against potentially damaging their only shield. This is a fairly punishing mechanic. Some of the shields in the game can only take two or three hits before breaking completely. Unfortunately, the motion controls aren't particularly reliable, a very grating and frustrating issue for the type of veteran player who would enjoy this sort of mechanic. Meanwhile, the type of player who probably wouldn't notice faulty controls is certainly going to run into trouble with the sections that require more precise execution, especially the pirate captain. I'm left wondering who Nintendo had in mind when they designed this combat. More than anything else, it's a viscerally obvious problem for both casual and experienced players, and I find it hard to believe that they missed something like this during a multi-year development cycle. A comparison with the Lantern in Twilight Princess illustrates how to do target audience properly. Much like the shields in Skyward Sword, the Lantern features a decision-making mechanic. It lights up dark areas, burns up spiderwebs, and just generally allows the player to better deal with poisonous objects. The trade-off is that it has limited fuel, a particularly important consideration given that players will need to experiment with it in order to understand its full potential. This creates opportunities for interesting decision-making, in which the player needs to decide how much fuel to carry and how to use the lantern as efficiently as possible while still benefiting from its existence. The first major use of the lantern occurs on the path toward the forest temple, when the player needs to use it in order to cross a poisonous swamp. This introduces a problem for the designer, Experienced players have already seen signs for the temple and could easily use the minimap to go there directly. Newer players, by contrast, might not figure this out, or they might get lost and run out of fuel, necessitating tedious trips back to purchase more oil. The designers solved this problem brilliantly. They introduced the lantern poison interaction using a non player character that the player needs to follow. Veterans have seen this character before and will now be engaged with the game's story and lore. Newer players will subconsciously absorb an important gameplay mechanic in a friendly and non-tedious way. The shop prior to the temple showcases equally strong design in its optional pricing model. Veterans will get a kick out of the different types of humorous dialogue, while newer players will be able to equip everything they need regardless of how many rupees they'd previously found. Any sort of limited resource mechanic is inherently unfriendly to newer players, so it's clear who the designers had in mind when they built this into the game. They managed to address the accessibility concerns by building an introduction that worked for both newer and older players. The intended audience doesn't feel alienated, but everybody else still has a chance to engage with the title if they pay attention. This approach genuinely broadens the game's audience without hurting its core experience. Skyward Sword is a brilliant game at its core, but for me the misunderstanding of its audience leads to a series of irredeemable design flaws. 
Personally, I can't help but wonder who it was actually designed for. The fact that E.G. Aonuma has stated that Breath of the Wild was designed as a better Skyward Sword makes me think that Nintendo has at least acknowledged these flaws to some extent, and that makes me much more excited for the next iteration in the series. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this video, please consider following me here or on Twitter and Facebook to receive regular content updates. The relevant links are in the description below. All the best, and see you next time.